I'm just going to go ahead and roll. Yep. Okay, thank you. So, enough of that. Uh, a little more about me, um, about why I'm giving this talk. Uh, for the last nine years, I've worked at a hospital in IT, or in, in Fairbanks, and uh, at the hospital, it's not an enormous infrastructure, but it's very 24-7. It doesn't get much more 24-7 than a hospital and these clinical systems that we've been putting in. So I've had my hand in a lot of different systems and um, have used Nagios um, to improve the situation with them. Before I was at the hospital, I was a web developer. And actually, in the last couple of years, I've moved back into web development at the hospital. So I have kind of a foot in both the system administration and development worlds. The central idea that I want to talk about and dwell on and explore with you is that monitoring tools are to the system and what testing tools are to the developer. I have kind of thought that way for several years, but this year I started kind of exploring that idea and uh, I think there's, there's a lot of fruitful um, work to be done in that area and hopefully um, you can use something from this to uh, improve the quality of the service that you're offering. Trying to figure out how to do hyperlinks in a presentation like this, and I decided this is the best way. Um, this is a, the short URL for a blog post I wrote this summer on this topic. It goes into more detail than I can do now. And uh, there will be a few more of these. If your camera likes those QR codes, you can try it. It may not work the first time. Typing it out usually works the first time or the second time. So we're going to talk about what test-driven development is and where it has come from, from the software development world. Then we're going to try to make a translation into the network and infra IT infrastructure monitoring world of NAGIOS and compare the test-driven approach to the monitoring environment, translate it. Then we're going to look at some sample tools that I've uh, written or found to um, take this idea further. and finally suggest some additional ideas. So first, an introduction to test-driven development. The software engineering world uh, was not the first to be concerned about quality, or quality assurance. Uh, there's a long tradition of quality assurance, uh, especially connected with manufacturing. So there are these things like the uh, UK's Institute of Quality Assurance uh, that produce definitions like this. In its broadest sense, quality is a degree of excellence, the extent to which something is fit for its purpose. In the narrow sense, product or service quality is defined as conformance with requirement, freedom from defects or contamination, or simply a degree of customer satisfaction. And they make the point that quality is judged not by the producer, but by the receiver. So it doesn't matter if everything is pickable, if the user judges that the quality is low, that's what matters. How do you get quality? That's the, what quality assurance always tries to do. You verify that the essential functions are there, and you hopefully screen out the defects before they are delivered to the customer. Software engineering has a harder time than other disciplines at doing this. Um, we've all experienced that. And uh, I think it's, uh, it's no wonder. I know Douglas Crockford has said that software is the most complicated thing that humans produce. Think about that. Probably true when you think about all the layers that go into making Microsoft Word crash. <laughs> it's pretty complicated. Um, <laughs> so the software world has approached testing at different levels, and there there are a lot of different um, competing terms and approaches to testing. I'm going to focus on these three. Uh, there are, there are other names and there are overlapping definitions. Um, but in, these are in order of abstraction. So unit tests are very specific, testing one single unit of software and uh, measuring whether it 
behaves as expected. They're low level. Integration? Oh, actually, here we go. And unit tests are usually expressed in a way that they have a, a yes or no answer. Integration testing puts the units together and tries to measure whether or not they're working together. Uh, sometimes the answers are more complicated than yes or no. Um, sometimes you might be measuring performance and things like that at this level. And so uh, you need to get into ranges. The, the difficult thing about integration testing in the real world is that uh, if you have a test environment, you never have all the conditions of the real world. You have to have a whole parallel universe to really simulate reality. So there's always a difference between test and reality. And then at a, at a higher level still is user acceptance testing, also called functional or customer testing. And that asks the question, does it work for the actual user? Does it do what the user needs to do? Um, it focuses on user stories. And an example of a, a user story that actually can be used in some test frameworks is as the user closing the application, so that kind of lays out the assumption, I want to be prompted to save anything that has changed since the last save so that I can preserve useful work and discard erroneous work. And you can run that test and verify whether or not it behaves as expected. Now, anybody who's worked on a program has done the old-fashioned developer hand method of running it and watching it crash, and then running it again and, and trying and hoping it won't crash, and then, <laughs> and then running it again and giving different input and trying it out and saying it basically works. But there's, there's a problem with that, and that's the developers, especially after the 18th time of you know, filling in all the form fields to make sure they validate. We start taking shortcuts and, and you know, we're lazy and imperfect, and so we need robots to do it for us. And by automating our tests, uh, we can get more thorough and consistent and fast results. Uh, we can make it more likely and more likely to fire off a test script that exercises the application than I am to actually go and click through all the user, user interface elements. It also gives us a scoreboard, and we can rig the results, right? Um, so hopefully we're always winning, because we're always passing our tests. So the extreme programming movement around, sort of around the turn of the century, uh, decided to look at everything that was good about software development and do it more. And they said, well, testing is good, so let's do it more, let's do it early, uh, let's actually write the test before we write the software. That way, we know when the test passes that the software is done. Um, let's test always. Let's let's write those test scripts and run them continuously every time we make a change, um, and that's often uh, continuous integration. Let's uh, anytime the source code changes, let's run the whole test suite, and if it, uh, if anything fails, then we'll make the siren go on or the lava lamp turn red instead of green. Or I mean, you know, developers, I mean, plugins exist for continuous integration products that hook it up to various USB devices or whatever uh, to give you real-time feedback. We have one of these uh, missile launchers, but we haven't yet hooked it up to an IDS. Uh, one of those rainy day projects. That'd be pretty cool if it knows who, you know, the contact group, you know, who needs to be fired upon. Uh, a more recent trend in, in the testing world, software testing, is behavior-driven development, which it doesn't uh, replace or uh, supersede anything about test-driven development. It just, it's a renewed focus on the user's at, uh, end of things. Instead of starting at the unit test level, behavioral-driven behavior -driven development starts at the user level. It doesn't ask, did the add or the addition object add the numbers properly? But it asks, can the cashier complete the sale? And so it starts at that user story level. One benefit of that is that you can negotiate with your users a good set of user stories. And then when your all of your user stories pass, then your software is done. And when your user says, but it doesn't do this, you can say, well, did we have a user story for that? Let's write one, let's negotiate, and so forth. So that's a uh, lightning 
12 minute overview of uh, test driven development. So let's take that to the monitoring world. We can do some test driving. <laughs> <laughs> my coworker, my coworkers were pretty excited about test driving monitors and they wanted to test driving and monitoring and they wanted to make sure that you saw that video. Um, so let's let's think about sort of where software engineering has taken the, the test uh, practice, the practice of testing and, and the emphasis on testing. And let, let's think about what that has to do with monitoring and with Navios. So the highest level, monitoring is concerned with quality assurance. Um, this is one of my favorite XKCD cartoons. The, uh, the mouse over text, which is always the second punchline on the XKCDs, is uh, the weird sense of duty really good sysadmins have can border on the sociopathic, but it's nice to know that it stands between the forces of darkness and your catalog servers. <laughs> so, yeah, as system administration, as administrators, we're all trying to deliver quality to the customer, even though we sometimes forget <laughs> about what, what that actually means. But. So let's, let's think about each one of these levels of testing and think about how that translates into monitoring. At the unit test level, we're concerned with things like, are the hosts pingable? Are the file systems writable? Uh, is everything at the OS level working? Are the services running? Is anything on fire? <laughs> this is actual footage from our data, data center and uh, an actual server on fire. Although my coworkers made this, they had a big screen up in the woods and they projected the video and then there was a lot of gasoline involved with the server and I don't know, <laughs> I was up late. They were so excited about you guys seeing this, so. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Stone Age special effects, I think. Yeah. So Nagios is especially suited for the, the low level unit testing uh, or unit monitoring. It comes with all these plugins for checking whether services and hosts are up. And you can, you can get really good coverage out of the box. Now, this level is really important. If, if the disk has failed, for example, or it is full and, and not writable, that's the most useful piece of information that we could, as administrators can get because we need to, who cares what the user sees, we need to handle that problem. Um, so we don't want to skimp on the unit testing level of detail. At the integration level, it's, okay, you it's, uh, it's a little harder to measure, but it, it matters. Uh, we need to know whether hosts can communicate with each other, whether the data is um, reasonable, whether the scheduled processes have completed, the backups have worked, and printing. Printing is always a weak point ever since I got my first computer when I was you know, eight years old or whatever. Printing breaks more often than anything else, right? Um, that is kind of an integration test because it could be back end, front end, network, hardware, out of paper. There are a few plugins uh, for Nagios to check at this sort of level. Um, one is the check MySQL query, which can actually run a query and, and interrogate your database and make sure that the data is living up to your expectations. Um, the HPJD script um, is for checking printers. But usually at, at this level, you end up kind of writing your own. Um, like I, I've written some in our environment to check back-end printers on our AIX node. Uh, check how many people are logging into the application to try to make sure that it's within the bounds of reason. Um, and uh, two other ones there uh, that I will be showing at my 4.30 talk if you want to see those. But at the third level, or the more abstract level of user acceptance, um, we would be looking for things that the user can feel, um, whether the app 
application and responds with acceptable speed, um, does the right things, whether the customer can buy stuff. In our hospital environment, we aren't, uh, we aren't selling things, um, but we are providing the infrastructure that doctors and nurses use to care for patients. And uh, whenever that's down, bad news. So we would like to make sure, not just that the hosts are paintable, but that the users can do what they need to do. And this is, uh, so far, I haven't used Nagios much at this level, and there aren't a lot of out-of-the-box functions for doing this. Uh, you might be able, with some of the content checks, uh, content checking with check HTTP, you might be able to sort of guess. Uh, but there's a huge opportunity here for development. So when you start thinking about all the things you could be monitoring, one of the first things that happens is you get overwhelmed and you get paralyzed because you don't know where to start. And uh, that's common with software testing too. And uh, I have some good advice here from Mark Jason Dominus uh, from the Perl community. He says, start by saying, I'll write one test or one Nagios check. Uh, you don't have to write all of them before you start your project. You know, even though the test-driven development says we write the tests first, and then we write the code, even that, they usually do cycle where they write a few tests, then write code to match. A few tests, write code to match. Um, but especially with existing applications, you can't, can't do that. So start with, start with one. Then, when you find a bug, uh, when you find a problem that takes your system down, it causes an outage, add a Navios check for that that would, would have notified you in that case if it didn't. And you'll find that you'll fix it much faster the next time. And if it's a routine failure, you can even add an event handler to actually um, take action to remedy the situation you know, before you can get to it. Uh, we had, we've used this once with uh, really good success. We had one service on our clinical system that it would just stop working, and all it needed to, all it needed was to be restarted. Now, some things you don't want to restart all the time. It could interfere with maintenance, for example, like when you really want it to be down, and then you have an agent starting it back up again. But in this case, um, something that used to involve paging at least two people. Well, it, it used to involve the users getting annoyed, maybe the first person who didn't have the skills or the access to do anything about it, who would then page the second person. Um, and now, Nagios detects the problem, starts the service again. And the users don't even notice. <coughs> Another kind of thing about adding a, a new check is when you add a new feature, uh, like more cameras on your iPad. Uh, Whenever you add a new service or install a new piece of hardware, that's a good chance to, to grow your test suite or your monitoring coverage. You also need to test your system administrators, especially yourself. Um, I know we always have these maintenance windows at these crazy times of day when I'm normally sleeping, and I'm not always my sharpest, even when I'm following the script that I wrote the day before, you know, that says what I'm gonna do during the downtime. And so I forget to turn things back on. Nagios reminds me, oh yeah, I forgot to turn that thing that I always forget on. Whenever you realize that you always forget something, that's a good, good thing to let Nagios remember for you. You know, this is good for monitoring your coworkers too. Uh, there are systems that I don't have any control over and they seem to randomly change. Um, and I make a lot of assumptions, like our firewall, for example. I assume that it's going to be configured the way it always is, right? But it's not. So uh, Navios can, can help confirm that all of our uh, assertions are true. Finally, try to test the users. When the user calls screaming that the login is slow, uh, I know my first tendency is to to ignore or dismiss, or assume that they're mistaken. Uh, but it would be nice if I actually had some sort of measurement of that, and I could uh, see whether or not logging was slow. Wouldn't that be nice? For the user, it doesn't matter why it's slow. Um, they don't care. They just want it fixed. I've been 
talking for like 20 minutes. So I wanted to pause. Does anybody have one or two questions or comments? Anybody? You know any good jokes? <coughs> Are you going to talk about like continuous integration systems anymore? Uh, not really anymore. We can talk about it later. Um, I, uh, I'm going to show you some examples of, of what I'm using Navios for yeah. uh, integrating with test systems that I already have. But we don't use, we don't have any continuous integration tools. Sure. I, I guess I was more thinking like uh, if you were a group that had something in place like for development, yeah. um, have you ever tried to move that sort of stuff into like against production um, Yes. I'll show an example of that in a minute. Yeah? Yeah. The uh, plugin thing you've written for Nagios, are those available for the people to use and help? Or is, uh, it, or is there any most way of them are help so to them? Uh, most of those, like the ones that I listed there, um, the check printers one is totally specific to our environment and our application. So I didn't bother sharing it. Um, and But uh, I'll, at my other session this afternoon, I'll be showing you how to write your own plugins. And uh, when, when I think they could be useful to somebody else, I do try to publish them. So. I just figured it might be nice if, if you had some out there, maybe other people could help contribute or something. Yeah. Cool, thank you. Was there somebody else who had a hand up? Okay. So, let me show you uh, where thinking this way, thinking about monitoring and tests, test driven development, has kind of led me. The first thing I started thinking about is uh, the test anything protocol. The test anything protocol is very widespread for Perl. Anytime you install a Perl module, it runs with a bunch of tests. Anytime you compile Perl, um, there are, let's see, there are over 92,000 tests written for Perl and over 142,000 before the libraries that just come with Perl, not to mention all of, all of the libraries on CPAN. And here's an example of uh, each one of these .t files is a, a list of tests, or is a, a script that runs a bunch of tests. Uh, and uh, at the unit test level, make sure that the module is working as expected on your particular system before you actually install it. Um, and this is from the actually the Nagios plugin Perl module. Test anything protocol has a very simple output format, actually similar in a way, especially in its simplicity to the Nagios plugins. Uh, it starts or ends with the uh, the counter the of the number of tests it expects to run. So one dot dot four means it's going to run four tests. And then it has either OK or not OK, and then a description of what happened. So this one was 50% successful, which is usually not acceptable. It's very easy to write test scripts in Perl. Uh, this is a simple example of one, and the output is here in the blue box. Uh, we just basically tell it to use the test module, which gives us the OK function. And uh, we check that the condition inside the parentheses is true. And if it's true, then our test passes. There are test frameworks for many other languages that produce the same tap output. And uh, if you haven't ever done written your own test scripts, then a uh, test tutorial is the place to start, for Perl, anyway. So I wrote a plugin that checks tap output. Uh, a Nav a Navios plugin. Uh, it's explained in the blog post that I had the URL for earlier, and this URL will take you to the actual code for this plugin. I'm showing you it's on the gist. If you run it with the uh, with one argument, the path to the test that you want to run, and it will tell Navios that it's OK if all the tests pass. You can also give it uh, thresholds for a critical or warning. For example, if you expect 
certain amount of failure or if you tolerate a certain amount of failure. Because it uses Perl's built-in test harness stuff, I found that right out of the box, I could do all these other things too. I can use another executable, like Ruby, to run a script. Like this would be a Ruby file that produces tap output. output. And so my NavGeos plugin can run tests written in Ruby and let NavGeos know if they are winning or not. Uh, you could also do remote checks by hooking up to curl or cat uh, to dump out a file. So anything that produces tap output, you can tell this plugin about. So following the rabbit hole further, um, I started thinking, oh, I could use some of the stuff, I could reuse some of the stuff that I've written over the years. Uh, back when we set up our firewall for our uh, DMZ with our, our web servers, and the DMZ is like a, you know, it's protected from the outside and protected from the interior network in case it gets compromised. Uh, I wrote, <laughs> partly because not, of not being confident that the firewall was always working as expected, as I mentioned. Um, I wrote some test scripts to verify that my assertions were correct and that the, the, especially that the hosts in the DMZ could communicate to the hosts inside the, the building, inside the firewall that they needed to, because that always seemed to be a problem. Either it was wide open or it was totally shut. And, uh, and then the applications on the hosts wouldn't work even though the hosts were up and yeah because they have to contact their services inside the, like uh, databases inside the network. So I wrote, back then I, I wrote a, another module for uh, basically trying to ping on different ports, checking the service responded. So I combined them all in one script, and now I can, the, when you run the script, it tries all those things from the web server in the DMZ and it verifies that it has its proper access to the internal hosts. Now, with one Nagios script, I can run that test script on the machine that I need to test from and, uh, and get the output. Now, this, this would otherwise take a whole bunch of plugins, a whole bunch of, I'd have to install a, a Nagios service on that host and uh, and make multiple checks, multiple configuration files. So in this case, I can write one Perl script, push it to all the TNT hosts, and then uh, tell Nagios to check it with the check tap plugin. Okay, so not far into that, I realized that some of my assumptions about internal hosts were uh, over optimistic. Uh, we have a farm of Citrix servers, there are about 30 of them, and uh, they're routinely, some of them are down, but it's okay if there are 30 of them. And who even cares why some of them are down? So uh, by using the thresholds, so I, I wrote a similar test script. Or actually, I, I chopped it up. It was originally one script. I chopped it up into two. And this one checks that all of the Citrix farm is available. But uh, I used the, the warning and critical thresholds with the plugin to tolerate a certain amount of failure. Again, that's something that out of the box, non use, it's a little bit hard to tell if these 30 hosts are mostly up. Um, so this is a this was a very convenient, especially since I had already written this many years ago, uh, it was a convenient way to roll up a bunch of tests together and get one page um, or, or email when more than three Citrix hosts are down. The third example is uh, using the Symphony framework um, for PHP. It's uh, sort of inspired by Ruby on Rails. Symphony 2 uses the PHP unit framework, uh, which is a, the most widely used unit test framework for PHP. And PHP unit supports tab output. So if you have modern developers using writing applications for you or selling them to you, they're already writing this sort of 
functional, functional and unit tests. Uh, Symphony is set up, it's got its own framework for simulating a browser and browsing the application and interacting with it. So this is an example of a, of a routine that tests the search feature of an app. Uh, it creates a crawler, gets the, the home page, fills in the search field with a value, and submits the form, and then we assert that the uh, response returns successful, not 404 or 500. 500 server error, that's my favorite. Um, and then it, uh, it looks that there was at least uh, one H3 element in the search results. Um, so it's this is starting to test at the user level, simulating what the user would do. And uh, since I'm a good Symphony developer, I already wrote this. Actually, I wrote it for the pre presentation because I knew I'd have to show it up. But in theory, uh, developers are already writing things like this uh, as they develop their applications to make sure they work. So uh, the PHP unit tool can run, uh, here I have it running three of those sets of tests, each one of them has multiple tests in it, and it produces path output. So I've just exercised the basic functions of my application, simulating a user with a browser, and I've got it in a path format, so I can tell, now I did this on my development environment, on my Windows box at work, and uh, so I have this horrible path stuff here, but, uh, but it works. It runs those tests slowly, but it, it actually exercises the application and tests it and kind of produces the non viewers okay. So this summer when I wrote the blog post, I also mentioned it on the non viewers mailing list and I got immediate feedback from, um, from, what was his name? Oh, Ranjib Day. And uh, he mentioned to me this great tool from the Ruby community uh, called Cucumber. The Ruby on Rails community is hipper than the Perl community. Hipper and cooler in every <laughs> way. Um, so they're doing behavioral development. And Cucumber lets you write your, feature, your features or your user stories in a language that the user can understand. It's not exactly English, but it's English enough for you to be able to show all of your user stories to the user and get their, their feedback on them. So this is an example of an actual Cucumber user story or feature. Um, and then uh, somebody wrote a, a Cucumber Navios plugin that will run these with Ruby and um, return a Navios plugin output so that you can get paged when your behavioral scripts are failing. So finally, um, where do we go from here? Where do we where do we take this idea? Um, I have I have a lot of ideas. I haven't had time to implement all of them yet, but. One thing I think we could do a lot more is test in production. We can reuse the tests that we've written during development as monitoring tools. And by bridging this gap, we can you know, hopefully make our Nagios network monitoring uh, for production apps aware of, of more of the application. Um, unfortunately, sometimes we are having to support applications that uh, nobody has ever thought of testing, you know, but there's obviously no quality control in this event, you know, this entire software vendor, um, and that's, anyway, sometimes, so you might have to actually use tools to develop your own. Another thing we've seen uh, already is that monitoring is important in development environments, too. Uh, we use a lot of tests or development copies of our clinical system, and we have a lot of people working on them. And the problem is they take days to set up because they're basically a copy from the production environment. And if the users, who in this case are the application experts who are building the next version or whatever, if they lose confidence in the development copy, then they want a new one. 
And so we found by turning on, or by using the same checks for production that we, and applying them to our test environment, we can make sure that our test environment is reasonably up. We turn down the notifications, you know, we never want to be woken up at night by a problem in a, in a test environment, but um, we can reuse a lot of the same strengths. And the continuous integration tools for development, uh, they're focused on continuous integration. They may be hooked up to a, a dashboard view on, on a web page or a siren or the Nerf Canon or whatever, but uh, they don't necessarily have all the features that Nagios is strong in, like alerting and time period based escalation and so forth. Another thing, as I showed in that uh, Citrix Farm example, is that uh, there's there's actually a lot of ambiguity in monitoring situations, and uh, the place to deal with it is in Nagios itself before it pages you, because um, you don't want it to spam you. And whenever it's over over noisy, then people start hating it and turning it off. Uh, so the place to tolerate ambiguity or a certain amount of failure is within your uh, within your plugins or your Nagios configuration. Another thing that uh, that the, especially the idea of user testing makes me think about is testing things from both sides. We usually test from inside the data center, trying to make sure everything's pingable. But um, can we test that an internet user can actually log into the application, for example? Uh, what tools can we have to run a remote uh, remote plugin somewhere on the somewhere on the internet? I'm thinking I've got a web host. For my own reasons, I could set up a PHP or CGI, Perl CGI on that web host that makes a request back to our website and tries to do something, right? And then I could, I could be checking the outside on the inside. There's more room to do that. And firewalls especially need that sort of asymmetrical testing because you, you can't test the outside of the firewall from inside the firewall. So you've got to somehow do it from the outside. Finally, we could do a lot more in uh, monitoring the, the things that the user actually experiences. And uh, it might give us an edge when the user calls and describes their uh, whatever they're experiencing, their issue. Um, it'd be nice if we say, yes, we already know about that. Uh, we see that it used to take 10 seconds to or it used to take one second to log in, and now it takes 10. Um, we're already working on that. There are a few tools out there for, for doing this, especially for web applications. Uh, as web applications get more complex and rely on JavaScript more and Ajax, it's harder to test them at a low level without a real browser with a JavaScript interpreter. So Selenium is a tool for actually running, you can run um, all the major browsers on the machine and make them run scripts, uh, test scripts, to exercise your application and make sure that it meets your requirements. Uh, if you have GUI applications, then you may be stuck with uh, tools like AutoIt or Apple Script, perhaps, to drive the application. Uh, I'll show in my presentation later this afternoon, I'll show an example using Apple or AutoIt that is pretty disgusting, actually. But maybe, hopefully, inspiring. Uh, and then we have all these mobile platforms, and they're still quite hard to test. This is actually the lead developer for jQuery mobile project, uh, a mobile library. And this is what he goes through. Um, <laughs> Yeah, we're, we are using it, and uh, I'm glad that you've done that, because I don't have to. Um, so again, central idea, start thinking about the similarities between software engineering testing 
that whole approach, that whole discipline. There are many, many books written about it. And what you're doing with IT infrastructure monitoring is not good. Perhaps if you need uh, some things to take away, if I can uh, get you to remember one of these things, it will have all been worth it, even the poor server that burned, so that you could see it burning. Um, finally, come to my other talk, 4.30, I'll be talking about writing your own plugins. Even if you don't ever want to learn Perl, come and see how it's done, and then uh, you'll get to your ideas for your cool language like Ruby. Any questions or comments? This is the actual, uh, after I put it out, <laughs> Dell Power Edge. <laughs> um, if you're too shy to ask a question now or, it, or too stunned and you think of something later, you can post on my blog. I'll try and answer it. Can we uh, go get the mics so we get this recorded? Yeah. Oh, it's <coughs> mute. On. Um, you talked a little bit about uh, some of the warning or critical error tolerances. Obviously, some user stories are more important than others, like if somebody can't log in or something. But do you have any tips on kind of divining those tolerances? Um, I suppose if, if you have an SLA, that would be really good. You know, we don't for anything. Uh, so I guess the best place to go with how well it's performing is to make a benchmark and then you know, compare your compare your future state with your current state. That way you know if you're improving or if you're getting worse. So um, you, even with functional tests, you usually are trying to express things in a yes or no format. So uh, you will make your application log in, for example, and then you'll check that there's an element on the page that is what you expect, and that it's not a 400 error, or, or 404, or 500 error. Um, and so you, you are boiling it down into yes or no questions that are, they're always an approximation of, of whether or not it's really doing what it's supposed to, but, but it at least gives you an idea. Um, and usually you want them to be 100%. Uh, the exception is if, if they return a number like uh, how many seconds or, or how much time it took, and then you want it to fall within a, a range. And most plugins, you know, are designed to handle all that sort of question. So, what makes you go with a uh, product like Nagios over? other open source or other monitoring solutions out there? Um, we actually have quite a mixture of monitoring tools in our environment. Um, honestly, I started with Nagios because my coworker went on vacation and he left me his list of things to check every day. <laughs> and I was like, there's no way I'm doing that. <laughs> and, uh, and I couldn't buy anything before he got back from vacation. It would have been way too long. But I could set up Nagios and, and configure it to at least check half the things that he checks every day. And then, anyway, so that's how I got started. I, it, for me, it was kind of a, I can do this without approval, so I'm going to. Uh, and that was in like 2005, 2006, um, Nagios score. I actually, uh, me and the paying for it at some point. We have other systems that don't work as well. So then other other coworkers say, you know, my monitoring system won't tell me this. So what can we do? And we end up growing Nagios from there. So Nathan, I mean, this sounds really useful and it's probably helped you immensely. I mean, I can tell, I mean, whether you're doing software development or anything, making sure something works and works reliably is really good. What, I mean, you snuck Nagios in, you know, a back door without approval. 
So obviously what you're doing is really beneficial to the company. Do people know about this now? And, and is it, do they know about the impact or can they see the positive benefit of what's yeah. happening? Yeah, uh, I've given a few of the presentations and you know, educated coworkers. Some coworkers, uh, maybe like from the Windows world, are like, oh, that was weird in Unity, I'm gonna stay away. And my approach has just been, whatever works for you, you know, that's fine. I'm gonna monitor my Windows servers that I am responsible for because, yeah. So we have kind of a heterogeneous approach. So I guess coming from, you said you started out as a, d a developer, um, when you're making a decision to either write checks with Cucumber or, or anything else, um, how do you decide whether it's right for you to write your own check or try to reap something out like something like Team City or s some purpose, you know, purpose written tools that are, will, will generate a lot of that stuff for you? How do you personally make that decision? I'm not familiar with Team City, um, but I always try, not, this is actually a bigger question, this is, this is about how I choose anything. Um, I all, personally, I always shoot for something with a, a live community that's, that's active. Like, um, for example, recently I needed to do a mobile friendly web app, and I went with jQuery Mobile because there are competing products, complete, competing open source or commercial projects that are uh, probably good, maybe better, but jQuery Mobile has active development and a community around it and documentation. So those are the things I look for. That's one of the reasons, another reason why I found out about Nagios. Actually, I think I first heard about Nagios in a book. Uh, um, maybe it was the System and Essentials of System Administration or uh, there's another book, Time, Time Management for System Administrators, and uh, they mentioned, I can't, can't imagine how I lived before now, uh, so I was like, well, there it is. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, for testing at the application level, you kind of need to write your own um, to get good coverage, to make sure that it's doing what you expect. So hopefully you can use a tool that makes it easy to write tests and fun, preferably. All right, thanks. Oh, one more? Sure. Um, if you want, you can just say it and I can repeat it in the mic. <laughs> um, as somebody who writes software and puts out a lot of new versions of software, something that happens a lot is you end up with uh, different versions of the same program on different servers or using a different database schema or something like that. Have you uh, run into any problems uh, during like installation or upgrading or trying to keep like a, a frequent update cycle using this kind of monitoring? looking for examples 
of symphony tests because my year old symphony test number <laughs> ran. It's like, oh, I should have been running more often, I guess. And then they would have, I would have known when they broke. Um, but things have changed enough over the last year that the ones I wrote during development don't run anymore. So using those same tests in production actually is the motivation also to maintain the tests, which later on should, I mean, it, it, it really will promote quality overall. Thanks for staying awake. I was, I was thinking it's going to be after lunch. People just keep. Thanks a lot.